The Progressive Era is a part of this larger kind of time period of the Gilded Age, um, but it's a specific particular part of it um, that really kind of begins um, with kind of the imperialism movement um, and really kind of takes off and really kind of finishes out the Gilded Age. Um, it incorporates some aspects of World War I. It incorporates a lot of domestic reform. What really kind of separates the progressive era from just kind of the generalized reform efforts, reform movements um, that we've talked about with the Gilded Age is really kind of the idea that it's from the presidents that this whole idea comes from, that the presidents push this idea um, out to people, that we have some significant laws that are changed, that kind of thing. Um, I've, with the presidents of progressivism, I include William McKinley, not because he's so much a progressive president, but he is a middle of the road kind of Republican uh, who in 1900 is very concerned. Um, the country has clearly drifted more progressive. Uh, a lot of this is in response to imperialism and the question about we have to make the world, you know, fix the world. We have to make make changes. Um, and so this kind of movement of progressivism that we see from Teddy Roosevelt, who's gone off on the Rough Riders and made this name for himself, McKinley wants to appeal to that particular group of voters. Um, so he brings Teddy Roosevelt on as his vice presidential candidate. Um, Teddy was actually very kind of conflicted about this, wasn't sure he wanted to be a vice president, but agrees to it. Um, and then shortly after he after he takes over, uh, takes office, he is assassinated um, by somebody who's not mentally well. And so McKinley is gone and Teddy Roosevelt replaces him as president. Um, and of course, Teddy Roosevelt is, you know, this big kind of imperialist, um, lots of kind of nativism, American superiority, that sort of thing um, really kind of marks this progressivism period. Um, so Teddy Roosevelt will be president, finish out McKinley's term from 1901. Uh, he'll compete in 1904. He'll win the presidency and he'll serve through 1908. Um, and then uh, William Howard Taft, who's kind of his hand chosen successor, will win in 1908. Um, and he'll be the president um, until 19 or through 1912 when Teddy Roosevelt will challenge him for the Republican nomination and you will actually have him running as a third party in the 1912 election this will divide the Republican vote leading uh, leaving Woodrow Wilson as the Democrat to win in 1912 um, and of course Taft whose name you might remember from the imperialism part um, he was the governor of the Philippines he kind of put an end to the Filipino insurrection, kind of got the military to kind of back down a little bit. Um, and Woodrow Wilson's going to come in and he's going to um, try to say he's bringing about a new sort of, uh, of progressivism, that he's going to do it a little bit differently. Um, so we'll be talking about Woodrow Wilson and kind of his complications later on. Um, things like the middle class concerns, we've already discussed this. Um, so you can kind of read through that yourself, but you want to be sure that you are familiar with those middle class concerns and that they are driving a lot of the push um, towards progressivism. Um, and these are things that are you know, trying to fix women, children working, health concerns, uh, wages, concerns about agricultural prices, overproduction, uh, concern about financial panics, monetary policy. There had been a big... Um, a big economic crisis in 1907 um, that ultimately, um, you know, that that causes was it J, uh, more, J. P. Morgan to have to bail out the U.S. government, that kind of thing. Um, so you've got corruption is a big issue. Questions about big business, cultural uh, has a lot of rapid change. You have urbanization, technology. Um, you are starting in the early 20th century, starting to have African Americans leaving the South, moving up north. Um, this is kind of the the Great Migration um, that's going to be enhanced by World War One and the factory jobs that are developed, um, and of course you should be fairly familiar with some of these leaders of the progressive era. Jane Addams and Hull House. I think I mentioned Carrie Nation and her temperance with the axe chopping up the bars. Alice Paul, women's suffrage. Um, she's one of the ones that goes on the hunger strike. Um, Upton Sinclair in the jungle. Ida Tarbell goes after uh, Standard Oil. W.E.B. Du Bois and African-American rights. Ida B. Wells um, and kind of the... the the issue of suffrage. Mother Jones was about child labor. Jacob Muir, you might want to remember his name. He's connected with Teddy Roosevelt because he's about conservation and the environment. La Follette ushers in a lot of the political reforms. And then, of course, the three progressive presidents. 
Um, muckrakers are a big driving force um, in this progressive era. Uh, this is a term that Teddy Roosevelt gives them. Uh, he calls these muckrakers the journalists that expose the problems of society, um, that expose the issues and kind of kind of really address um, you know all of these issues, all of these problems propelling the idea of reforms, why reforms were needed, um, and really began to produce some changes. So let's look at Teddy Roosevelt. So um, I put on here, he's a new kind of president. Um, he began as a New York legislator, was New York police commissioner, rough rider, assistant secretary of the Navy, um, vice president for McKinley, huge advocate for physical activity. He'd struggled with uh, asthma as a child, had been very sickly, so he believed that physical activity was the answer. Um, he's very individualistic in that he said he feels that individuals and businesses should be able to compete, but he sees the role of the government as kind of leveling the playing field. So rather than having that raw competition of social Darwinism, he's going to suggest that what you really need is kind of a government to come in and make sure both sides play fair. Um, and that in, in that context, you can have a competitive environment. His big concern is he doesn't want the radical changes of, say, socialism uh, or anarchism uh, to take hold in the United States. So he sees government as kind of balancing the scales, as preventing those kind of radical ideas. Um, He's absolutely an Anglo-Saxonist, believes the American system is the best, huge supporter of Mahan's naval theory, which we talked about with imperialism. Um, and he is a strong executive. He will use the executive office in all new ways, um, you know, particularly with a, what we call the bully, pul bully pulpit, um, the ability of the president to command the press, um, to get the press to pay attention to him. Um, and, you know, he has a tendency to kind of dictate to the Republican Party. So he's way far ahead of what the Republican Party wants to do. Um, this is going to create some frustration with the Republican Party. Um, you know, so he's very much a strong president. Um, and, you know, he'll be, you know, the progressive presidents, both Roosevelt and Wilson are strong in different ways. Um, and you won't really have another strong president after this until you get to Franklin Roosevelt. Um, so his big push is that we need to solve issues at home. We need to resolve uh, tensions and competition because it's creating radicalism. He believes that trusts are hurting business competition and hurting the economy. So he will use the Sherman Antitrust Act in all new ways to go after those monopolies, to go after those trusts. Um, he does tend to differentiate between good trusts and bad trusts. Good trusts are those that have you know, produced an a, a innovation in the economy or in products and therefore deserve kind of a honeymoon period, if you will, where they can have kind of a monopoly because they have to recoup their research and development. Or sometimes a good trust could be one that's really good at what it does. It's just lean and mean, um, but it's not trying to destroy its competition. A bad trust is one that exists to kind of destroy its competition. Um, he's going to also encourage or lead the way for the government to use the Interstate Commerce Commission, the Interstate Commer Commerce Act, um, to go after railroads that are hurting the economy and charging certain companies more than other companies. Um, so he's going to definitely use the Interstate Commerce Act. Um, he will be very concerned about social problems. He's going to see social tensions, racial tensions, uh, and even tensions over women's suffrage as being things that distract us from kind of having this, this happy kind of cohesive uh, American environment. Um, he will invite Booker T. Washington to dinner in the White House uh, in an effort to kind of do this. Now, he'll face a lot of criticism for it, um, but he definitely wants to, to bring about some conversation on child labor, uh, focus on public education, those kinds of things, uh, really to help kind of produce kind of a much more, much more stable kind of American system. He's looking at this and he says, you know, the people are are, at, are, are fussing at each other, right? The, the people that own businesses, the workers, he wants to stop that. Um, he believes in arbitration for strikes. So he will, there's a couple of times he will interfere when workers go on strike and he'll kind of interfere on behalf of the workers and tell the business, hey, you have to sit down and negotiate a deal with people. Um, his big message is what he calls the square deal. Um, this is about government acting as kind of this intermediary, but balancing out big business interests, making sure everyone gets a fair deal, a square deal, right? Um, 
And um, his goal is to make the economy stronger and that a stronger economy that promotes fairness is going to resolve tensions between groups and that the government was the way to do this. Now, he tends to view the government very, very favorably. He'll, you'll see him, you know, when he talks about his Roosevelt corollary and, and the government int- being an intermediary in foreign policy. Um, this is kind of what he has in mind. Now, it's under Roosevelt that the jungle is put out. Um, and Teddy Roosevelt will respond to the jungle um, very specifically, um, going after you know the, the meat industry with the Pure Food and Drug Act um, and with the Meat Inspection Act. Those two things are meant to get rid of the patent medicines that create disease uh, or create sickness, uh, and then the, the meat that creates disease and kind of clean that part up. And that's a direct response to um, public criticism, public uproar, um, related to Upton Sinclair. Um, then you've got him, he reaches out, or actually John Muir reaches out to him um, over uh, the environment, and John Muir is the founda- founder of the Sierra Club. And the Sierra Club, uh, you know, is concerned about businesses drilling uh, in these nat- national or natural areas, right, that will become the national parks. Um, so Muir invites Roosevelt to come out to the Grand Canyon and they stay out there. And he gets Roosevelt to agree um, that we need to protect the nation's, you know, res- you know, kind of national treasures. Um, so things like the California Redwoods, the Grand Canyon, the Yosemite National Park. Um, so he'll designate those as national parks. Um, he will create the Forest Service um, to monitor the national parks. And then he'll also kind of address the idea of flood control and that sort of thing. Now, his foreign policy is one that is tied to uh, the Navy, right? Um, I think I've already mentioned the Great White Fleet, um, trying to check Japan's ambitions, remind Japan that, hey, we're the big dogs in the block. Um, He reasserts the open door policy with China. Um, So the big change that we see happening is going to be the Roosevelt Corollary. Um, This is going to cause the U.S. to be a policeman kind of the peacekeeper, the promoting stability in the Western Hemisphere. Um, a lot of this comes in on the heels of unrest due to European influence, due to um, a lot of these these Central and South American countries being frustrated with either British influence or American influence. Um, so he'll create kind of this idea that the U.S. can kind of intimidate other countries, kind of step in and interfere. We certainly know that he does this with the Panama Canal. Um, and he says the phrase, you know, walk softly, carry a big stick. Um, and so he's not afraid to use this big, strong military, just like he did with the Great White Fleet. Um, and so this is how he interferes with the Panama Canal. Again, I encourage you to go back and listen to the imperialism lecture where I kind of talk about that. Um, and his big goal is he wants to shorten that trip so that we don't have to go all the way around South America. So supports the Panamanian Revolution, Um, lots of more science and technology, all that kind of stuff. And the whole goal of this foreign policy is more places to ship goods and ease the problems of overproduction. So if he's trying to use the government to intervene here at home and balance out issues, he's trying to use the government in foreign policy uh, to open up new markets and to kind of create stability overseas. Um, That's kind of his whole big point, right? Um, So this kind of gives you an idea of the locations of Roosevelt's foreign policy and kind of how that works. Um, Ultimately, he's trying to promote trade and competition um, with the government being kind of this intermediary. Um, And he definitely kind of sees the government as having a role to play um, and tries to promote the general welfare. So Teddy Roosevelt's policies are pretty progressive. He is a very strong president, can tend to rub people the wrong way. Um, so you have, um, also you have, he's followed by William Howard Taft. So, um, Teddy Roosevelt decides not to run in 1908 because he says, you know, basically I've served two terms. George Washington only served two terms. I should respect that. He also is kind of interested in going on a safari. So he wants to kind of have a vacation. Um, so he's going to kind of handpick William Howard Taft, who had been, uh, the governor of the Philippines. He had been, uh, the secretary of the Navy, which is kind of secretary of the war kind of position. Um, and, um, he had been in charge of that, 
Um, and it worked really well with Teddy Roosevelt. So Roosevelt felt like he was leaving his kind of progressive agenda in good hands, if you will. Um, now, what will happen is that, ta that Taft is not Teddy Roosevelt. He's not as aggressive. He's not as in your face. He doesn't use the bully pulpit. He's much more likely to administer and kind of administer, administer things faithfully. Um, but that includes working with Congress, right? So he sees Congress as being a part of the system. He's a judge. He's a lawyer. Um, so he has deep respect for the for the separation of powers. Um, and so in that process, you have some protective tariffs getting passed, which Teddy Roosevelt thought were a little bit unfair because they favored businesses at the expense of farmers. Um, he'll allow the anti-progressive movement to kind of gain a little more headway in the Republican Party. Um, he tends to go after all trusts, whether they're good or bad. Um, he particularly goes after Standard Oil. Um, so again, he's, he's not as particular. For him, trusts are bad because anything that restrains competition is bad. Remember, Teddy Roosevelt wanted to examine, you know, well, do they have a reason is there a justification why they're restraining competition? And is there a point at which we can say they need to stop, right? Well, for Taft, there, there is no justification. You, you don't kind of, you don't have exclusions and exceptions for every single issue, right? Um, so he's definitely kind of out of that. Um, part of it, too, is the panic of 1907 had everyone kind of afraid um, of rock raw uh, competition and kind of interested in the government coming in. Uh, the big thing he does is he fires the, the head of the Forest Service that Roosevelt had liked um, because he gets crossways with some congressmen. Um, and so that's going to upset Teddy Roosevelt a whole lot. Now, he will, under his administration, create the Bureau of Labor to monitor labor statistics, the Bureau of Mines to monitor, monitor mining statistics, and he will increase the power of the Interstate Commerce Commission to regulate railroads. So he does do things. He does expand some government agencies to monitor and balance interests. But overall, he's, he's more of a kind of a middle-of-the-road guy, um, doesn't want to ruffle any feathers, plays nice with others, that kind of thing. Um, his foreign policy is all about money. He encourages American businesses to invest in what is called dollar diplomacy. So American businesses do invest in Mexico and Central America, which ultimately leads to more American involvement in that region, more concern about instability. Um, and that's going to result in kind of some, some longstanding hard feelings in that area, up to and including kind of, you know, the instability in the region today. Um, and so because of that, um, you know, his, his dollar diplomacy will actually come under question as whether or not it was a good idea um, to encourage businesses to invest like that. Um, the big problem is going to be that he attacks trusts um, without worrying, you know, without kind of those exceptions. And he's not as concerned with the environment. And he just doesn't handle the Republican Party the same way that, that Teddy Roosevelt does. Um, so he doesn't really excite anybody. He's not an exciting prog progressive. He's not an exciting Republican. Um, he's neither w more one thing than the other, and that's part of the issue. Um, and you can see in this cartoon right here, patting the big stick, kind of softening up that walk softly carry big stick of the Roosevelt Corollary. Um, Taft was a round guy. He was pretty large, like 400 pounds. They had to bring in a special bathtub for him because he was so large. Um, so again, kind of this idea of American imperialism, American trade, um, those kinds of things. So Taft encourages foreign investment, fosters cooperation here at home, um, and but he's not really recognized for kind of contributing to progressive efforts. In fact, he's perceived as having kind of stopped um, Roosevelt's interest in kind of expanding progressive policies. Um, so this is kind of the problem with Taft. Um, he will be followed by Woodrow Wilson. So the 1912 election um, is known because it's a really a four-way contest. And for the Democratic Party, you're going to have Woodrow Wilson, who is the president of Princeton University. He was a history professor, um, and he was also born in Georgia. So he was a good Southern boy. Um, that's going to matter some here in a minute. So he's a good Southern boy. Um, he becomes kind of the voice of the progressive Democrats. So he kind of appeals to the South because he, he has that Southern heritage, and yet he's fully embraced the notion of progressivism. Um, so we really kind of see the marriage of kind of the Democrats and progressive policies in a way that William Jennings Bryan was never able to do. Um, so absolutely, this kind of changes things. And part of it's because they want some economic stability. Remember, we've had the crisis 
the economic crisis of 1907. Um, and so people are kind of wanting to kind of create a, a better, more fair system. Um, and he definitely sees presidents as being strong, that they should represent the will of the people. Um, so he's going to be another strong president. Um, he also believes in leading by a moral example. He's very kind of high and mighty, very full of himself, very self-righteous. Um, he's going to lead with a new moral example. And the United States will lead with a new foreign example, or a new um, moral example, rather. Um, and so he comes out with this policy called new freedom. And what he says is, we're going to go away from this use of the government as trying to force a fair playing field. So we're going to have a different way of using the government. The government's not going to regulate as much, but we will be more aggressive about using the laws that are already on the books. So we will go after railroad companies that, that have rebates. We will go after monopolies and use the Sherman Antitrust Act, but we're not going to continue to create new agencies, new laws, new, new groups like that. Now, we'll see that that doesn't hold true either. Um, so from night, so that's kind of what he'll be doing from 1912 to 1916. 1914, World War I breaks out in Europe. Um, so from 1914 to 1916, he says, oh, we're going to stay out of the war. We're going to stay out of the war. He wins in 1916, largely on the promise of he kept us out of the war. And then in 1917, we're going to get sucked in thanks to unrestricted submarine warfare. And he will use this whole idea that, um, that, you know, that World War I is a moral cause, that we're defending democracy around the world, that sort of thing. Um, his uh, approach to the economy is an economy that to encourage competition, um, the idea of lower tariffs, right? So that, um, that, that way they can, um, they can help farmers um, and they can, you know, that the competition will help create um, the better products, better jobs, that kind of thing. But since the, the com the, since the government's going to have lower tariffs, how are they going to pay for things? So this is where you come up with, you have the full adoption of the Populist Party um, progressive income tax. Um, so the 16th Amendment is the income tax amendment. You do need to know that. Um, that is the individual income tax. Um, and so you see that the, the economy is kind of operating as a large Kind of national kind of picture. It's not just based on individuals or individual states. Now you have a true national economy because of the federal income tax. That comes about in 1913. Also in 1913, he creates the Federal Reserve to help balance out the gold and silver issue and help respond to, uh, you know, kind of political or economic instability. Um, he creates seven regional banks. These banks control the deposits of other banks, control interest rates and how much it costs to borrow money. And this way, it's meant to kind of answer to this gold silver silver question. Do we have tight money, loose money? This is where you have the introduction of this idea about interest rates and how interest rates um, are really kind of the big, the big issue, right? Um, and that comes about with the Federal Reserve. Um, again, 1913, you have this national economic system, and it does kind of slow down the boom and bus cycles of industrialization and that sort of thing. Um, Federal Trade Commission, 1914, it monitors, monitors businesses for fair trade practices um, to make sure and keep an eye on those trusts so that they don't get out of hand. And then in, uh, you also have him passing the Federal Farm Loan Act to provide low interest loans. So a lot of this is going to be things that the Populist Party would have been really excited about, the income tax. Um, while it's not putting silver into the economy, you definitely see uh, Wilson and the Federal Reserve Act kind of trying to create some balance and kind of loosen the money supply, as well as keeping eye on businesses, and then, of course, making it easier for farmers to borrow money. Um, the next step is going to be kind of an address of political corruption. The 17th Amendment, the direct election of senators, is meant to remove big business influence from politics. Um, and so this is going to bring you to um, kind of, again, this other, this other populist kind of platform thing uh, with the 17th Amendment. Um, and I've mentioned before Robert La Follette and how he ushers in these kind of changing political things at the state level, whether it's the initiative, the referendum, the recall, the direct primary. Um, and then, of course, I've mentioned before the city council, the city manager form of government that removes the ward bosses and that kind of thing. Uh, moral society, you do have him passing an eight-hour workday for for railroad workers and federal workers um, that will influence other businesses to decrease um, their, um, their work days to eight hours a day. 
Um, you're going to have him kind of focusing, encouraging states to improve working conditions. Uh, he will attempt to outlaw uh, child labor with the Keating Owen Child Labor Act, but the Supreme Court will say, no, you can't do that. Um, Got to love the Supreme Court. Um, 18th Amendment will be passed towards the end of his second administration, um, and that will pass the manufacture, sale, and transportation of alcohol. Um, a lot of this is kind of comes out of the concerns about society, what what alcohol consumption does to the working poor, um, what it does to factory workers and that kind of thing. Um, but it's also kind of a an anti-German sentiment to kind of go after uh, German immigrants who like to drink beer and kind of target those particular industries. Um, so it's got, got a lot of complicated origins to it, um, but you do want to be familiar that it has happens, what the 18th Amendment is. When you're 18, you can't buy alcohol, um, and that it happens under Woodrow Wilson. And then it's considered a progressive amendment um, because, again, it's about that social control. We're going to control what people do in society. Um, so we're going to make it so they can't drink. Um, the last big one that happens under his administration is the 19th Amendment. Uh, that will give women the right to vote. Now, that has a whole lot more to do with Alice Paul and the National Women's Party. Uh, they stand as silent sentinels out in front of the White House with signs that say, Mr. President, how long must women wait? Uh for liberty. Um, and it kind of embarrasses him and it makes it kind of hard for him. And remember, he's all about that moral high ground. Um, and of course, part of it too is we're in the middle of World War I when this happens and Amer women are working really hard. America is very patriotic. And so that, so it actually gets kind of passed as sort of a, a war measure that women are working in the factories. They're making money. They should be able to vote. Um, they're a part of this war effort too, um, which is absolutely kind of what it was. Now, now, Wilson was not a big fan of women's suffrage initially. Um, he was pretty reluctant to do so. He didn't, you know, good Southern gentleman. He didn't think women needed to. Um, but ultimately, he gets kind of backed into a corner and decides to cave on it. Um, one thing we don't see under under Woodrow Wilson is any concern about African Americans. Like I said, he's a good Southern boy. He's not as concerned with with black issues. And then when you're talking about foreign policy, you have Wilson kind of opposing the, the broad ideas of the Roosevelt Corollary and dollar diplomacy. Um, he's going to lead this moral example um, and rejects the, the Roosevelt Corollary and dollar diplomacy, embraces what is called watchful waiting. Um, but you have all these businesses that have invested heavily in these countries. Um, and when there's political instability, when the workers get frustrated, uh, it makes it kind of hard for uh these businesses just to walk away from all the money that they're making. So they turn to the United States and say, hey, you know, can't you help protect my business? So one of the things we'll see happening is that he actually ends up using troops far more than Roosevelt or Taft do um, because he's feels like he's getting sucked into these conflicts, right? Uh, the Mexican Revolution, which we'll, we can mention in class, Mexico, uh, due to American investment and exploitation, had a revolution. Um, and so you had a lot of kind of incursions over the border, um, including in, I think it's New Mexico, and a couple of people were killed. So uh Wilson has the U.S. military chase Pancho Villa all the way into Mexico. Um, they never catch him. Um, he tries to promote stability in Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, and Haiti um, to protect American interests. And then, of course, Virgin Islands um, are purchased in this period. Um, and, it, and it's not really very different, right? Um, so Wilson will claim that he wants smaller government. He doesn't want the gov government to be as much in our lives, but ultimately he creates more government. He creates the IRS. He creates, uh, you, you have um, the idea of the Adamson Act. You have, um, you know, you have him doing those things that really kind of the Federal Reserve, for instance, um, increasing the size of government, making it very different. Um, he tries to not use military force, but ultimately he does multiple times. Um, and he's not a big early adopter of social change. He resists social change, um, women as well as African-Americans. Um, so he's very, very slow to adopt those things. Um, the election of 1812, so this is the election I was referring to, um, primarily between Wilson, Roosevelt, and Taft. Um, Eugene Debs of the Socialist Party will be around. 
He does win a tiny, tiny percentage of the votes, but for the most part, he's a non-entity. Um, but it is important to note that you had a socialist running for president in 1912. Um, so the real election is going to be split between Wilson and Roosevelt, right? Roosevelt comes back from his African safari um, and realizes that Taft has not aggressively pursued his policies, that he's fired Pinchot, and Roosevelt's all upset. So he decides um, to challenge um, Taft and the Republican nomination. Again, a lot of this has to do with the way Taft handled antitrust laws, those kinds of things. Um, and so what will happen is this competition will ultimately um, not work out very well for Teddy Roosevelt. Too much of the old party machine politics are in place. Um, and so what will happen is that Roosevelt will lose to Taft in the Republican nomination. Um, Taft wins it. Uh, Roosevelt goes on to create his own party, the Progressive Party. Um, so this is a third party election, kind of like we saw back with uh, with previous third party elections. Um, and he gets nicknamed the Bull Moose. Um, after he is, somebody tries to shoot him and it hits a speech that's in his jacket pocket and it stops the bullet in his speech. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Um, so the Republicans and Taft, um, they will kind of be blah, right? Nobody pays a whole lot of attention to them. It's the progressive party and the Democrats that have all the attention. Roosevelt runs on a platform of new nationalism that relies on a strong president, a strong federal government and serious regulation. Lots and lots of regulation. He's going to be all up in the state's business, making sure that they're doing things. Uh, and there's a lot of people that are very nervous that this is too radical. Woodrow Wilson um, will embrace the new freedom platform, more modest, uh, more reform based. Um, and so, you know, while he's going to lose the most progressive voters, he's going to maintain the moderate progressive voters. Um, and so socialist, the Eugene V. Debs, um, while American socialism is completely different from European socialism, um, it does, you know, he doesn't have the support that he needs to really well launch a significant challenge. Um, so this kind of gives you an idea about how the election results panned out. You can see that Wilson won most of them. Um, and so, you know, it, you know, while you do have clearly in the popular vote, um, you know, the Republican Party uh, and the Socialist Party kind of split the vote. Um, and, and it's not that it's not that Wilson has the majority vote, but he does have the Electoral College. And the election of 1912 shows us that even when strong third party candidates, uh, even that even strong third party candidates will struggle to get enough votes and that one of the major parties will lose the votes they would have otherwise had. Um, so the last thing I'll leave you with is what is the impact of the progressive era? Um, you cannot deny the Panama Canal and Roosevelt's foreign policy. Um, and the impact of that, of course, it's completed right before World War I, um, the beginning of identifying malaria, understanding mosquitoes. Um, you have some significant medical developments come out during this period that the manufacturing sector has definitely strengthened because of this. Um, so you want to kind of keep in mind of that. Um, we have some contradictions. Uh, government should play a role in regulating the economy and solving social problems. So absolutely, we should be able to turn to the government and say, hey, move the dead horse, right? Um, this is part of why we have the expectations we do of our government today. No, it's not perfect. There's a lot of, of ways in which the government does not succeed and where it, it drops the ball. But fundamentally, um, what we have is that the government actually um, trying to do trying to do what it can to, to balance out the issues. Now, sometimes it goes too far um, and uses too much control, like in the prohibition with the 18th Amendment. Um, but generally speaking, it's about regulating the economy to solve social problems. Uh, they expand democracy, the 17th Amendment, um, direct election of senators, the, the, the reforms of the secret ballot, the primary, those kinds of things. Um, and that's going to benefit the middle class the most. So the poor uh, and the immigrant neighborhoods will lose out in that process. But you can't totally deny that it does improve democracy and remove some of the big business influences um, that were perhaps perhaps maybe holding the government back um, from embracing change, encouraging them to chase after things like imperialism. Um, and you have lots of public health and sanitation concerns um, and lots of efforts to clean up the cities. 
The economy um, does improve in the sense that you have the Federal Reserve now to create a balance in the economy. Um, and you start to see them, you know, relying on the progressive income tax, those kinds of things. That eases things for farmers a little bit. Uh, the Federal Reserve improves the way the economy functions. Um, we also see the great migration of African Americans from the north to the from the south to the north. Um, the NAACP begins to organize African American communities into voting blocks. So we start to see the early efforts of the NAACP. Um, discrimination is still around, but it's it, you know you have kind of a different environment with African Americans moving north, um, and you know. We don't have a lot of change. Certainly Woodrow Wilson will show uh, birth of a nation in the White House, right? So, so there's problems in this period. Again, government's not perfect, um, but it is at least attempting to make to address some of these issues. Um, I've mentioned eugenics before, the false belief that uh, encouraging reproduction in those with favorable traits um, and limiting reproduction in those with unfavorable traits create a better society. So again, this idea that science, efficiency, um, study can produce kind of these better uh, results, if you will. Um, and this eugenics will be used to justify uh, immigration restriction. Um, attitudes like that will be used to justify birth control, um, which was pretty controversial in the early 20th century, um, as well as kind of the imperialism idea that we've, that we've talked about in class. Um, public education, the end of child labor. Um, we don't actually achieve the end of child labor, but we do at least agree to study child labor um, with the National Child Labor Committee, um, and they will begin to collect statistics on what child labor looks like so that eventually we will be able to do away with it. Um, and a lot of businesses will begin to realize with the progressive era of Roosevelt, Taft, and Wilson that if we can either choose to treat our workers better and talk to them and have arbitration with them and negotiate with them, and shorten their workday and pay them better, or we can continue to treat workers like garbage and then the government will come in and breathe down our necks. And so they don't want that. So you start to have the impact of businesses starting to kind of clean things up. Uh, foreign policy wise, the immigration quotas that increase that are increasing uh, that begin in 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act um, and really culminate really just after the Progressive Era in 1920, 1921, where we really massively uh, decrease the number of immigrants we allow with immigration quotas. Um, and that's meant to kind of stop cities from being crowded um, and that kind of thing. Um, so you want to kind of keep in mind now, again, immigration policies are influenced by other things. Um, the open door policy, uh, the Roosevelt Corollary, also tend to set the standard that the U.S. is going to be involved in foreign policy issues, um, that we're going to be you know, checking on Latin America, that we're going to maintain and preserve China. Um, and so that kind of tends to uh, complicate things as well as the dollar diplomacy increasing a reliance on military protection for foreign investments. Um, this will ultimately result in, in isolationism and laissez-faire in the 1920s, but we'll be getting to that. Um, so again, this question about laissez-faire government, this question about trust and antitrust, um, Interstate Commerce Commission and controlling railroads, as well as trying to clean up consumer goods for individuals and make things better. So um, that's kind of the lecture portion of this. I know I went really, really fast. Um, we're going to go over some documents, not documents, uh, kind of like a, a live binder in class that will kind of walk us through some of these issues. But hopefully you've had a chance to listen to this so it won't be totally foreign to you um, and you can ask me some good questions.